This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform where entrepreneurs can easily create and customize their own personal or professional website. More on Squarespace later in the video. So hello and welcome to yet another episode of Geographics. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood, and today we're talking about the Nevada test site and nuclear weapon testing in America. And all videos on Geographics are based on scripts, and this one is no different, and that script was written by one Larry Holsworth, who you can follow at the links below if you are so inclined. Also, just as a formality, I've been handed down a mandate from the people up top aka just the people who run the channel behind the scenes, I need to say the words like, comment, subscribe, because analytics show that by simply saying that, those three things are more likely to happen. Isn't that fun? Let's get to it. The first atomic bomb was detonated in the New Mexico desert on July 16th, 1945. It yielded the distinctive mushroom cloud that has become a symbol of the Cold War and nuclear weapons ever since. The next two atomic bombs to detonate were over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, those remain the only two atomic weapons used in an act of war, or at least we should say an act of hot war. The Cold War, however, was an entirely different story, and while it was free from full-blown combat, it saw the detonation of thousands of nuclear weapons nonetheless, in tests that were often intended much as a demonstration of power as they were an evaluation of their effectiveness in combat. At first, only the United States had atomic weapons, and thus only they could test their arsenal. They were later joined by the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France, the People's Republic of China, India, Pakistan, South Africa, and no doubt many, many others. For example, most analysts concede that Israel is also armed with nuclear weapons, though they have never confirmed one way or the other. The result of this growing nuclear club, as we're going to call it, was test explosions of atomic and later thermonuclear weapons, also called hydrogen bombs, across the globe, in the atmosphere, under the sea, and underground. Nowhere is safe. One site which saw extensive testing was, and is, located in Nevada, just 65 miles from Viva Las Vegas, established in 1951 as the Nevada Proving Grounds, has undergone several name changes over the years. It has also seen the detonation of over a thousand nuclear warheads, with about 100 of them taking place in the upper atmosphere. During the 1950s, atmospheric tests created the iconic mushroom clouds, which could easily be seen in Las Vegas from the Strip. In fact, they were so common that some casinos used the law of seeing an explosion up close and personal to lure in tourists. The testing of nuclear weapons has been, shall we say, controversial since the first Trinity test in July 1945. Fallout from atmospheric testing at the Nevada Proving Grounds led to increased rates of numerous types of cancer in the areas affected, traceable since the 1950s. The site has been the scene of anti-nuclear protests and for over 40 years served as the main nuclear testing site used by the United States. And for anyone curious, since 1962 atmospheric testing has been suspended by the United States and underground testing has been suspended since 1992. Yet the Nevada site remains under the control of the US government through the Department of Energy, kept in readiness should the need to resume testing arises. But that's all getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start, as they say, at the beginning. Operation Crossroads was the first test by detonation of an atomic bomb since the Trinity test in 1945, and the stated purpose of these tests was to evaluate the damage done to warships by the newly developed weapons. And three explosions were planned. One was an airdrop from an army bomber set to explode several hundred feet above ships at anchor in a lagoon called Test Able. The second was an explosion of a bomb submerged beneath the ships, and the third test would have been from further below that, from a greater depth. And in regards to the third test, it was ultimately cancelled because the ships that survived the the second test could not be used in the third test because they were too heavily contaminated by radiation to have them readied for another test, which, remember, involved detonating another nuclear bomb below them. As for the ships selected for these tests, they were all veterans of the Second World War that were due to be scuttled anyway. These included the battleships Arkansas and New York, the aircraft carrier the Saratoga and Independence, and the German heavy cruiser the Prince Eugen. The latter ship, taken by Americans as a war prize, had fought alongside the fabled and much better known Bismarck in 1941. The tests, which were announced to the public beforehand, were largely viewed as a means of determining whether the US Navy was still a viable military force in the age of atomic bombs and precision bombers. Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands was selected as the site of these tests. The 197 native residents of Atoll were not consulted as part of the decision because 
the US sucks. The Navy ultimately relocated the natives to a much smaller atoll which proved insufficient to support their lifestyle, which consisted of lagoon fishing and growing sparse crops. Following Operation Crossroads, the US government returned to Bikini several times in the 1950s, testing larger and ever more powerful weapons, including the largest ever detonated by the United States. The atoll remains completely uninhabitable in the 21st century. The ships designated for Crossroads were manned, in a sense, by animals, including goats, pigs, and guinea pigs, amongst others, which led to considerable protests before the event itself. In addition, numerous scientists, military brass, and politicians were invited to witness the blast, including Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, who declined the invitation and wrote to President Truman protesting the test, calling it wholly unnecessary. Like, he'd already, you know, seen what nuclear bombs could do, and he was, he was just not about that life. Up until Crossroads Test Baker, all four atomic explosions, Trinity, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Test Abel, had been air bursts, exploding at elevations well above their target. Test Baker, on the other hand, thrust columns of seawater into the air, which, along with the steam, drifted with the prevailing winds before dropping back to Earth in the first measurable experience with radioactive fallout. Most of the damage caused by the blast was limited to the ships closest to the explosion point. The fallout, on the other hand, contaminated some of the ships so badly they could not be cleaned adequately to allow complete examinations. The experimental animals, and, and because we know people are wondering, what about the guinea pigs? Um, the ones that survived uh, ultimately developed various forms of cancer and died. Which means I am able to say the sentence, the United States military once dropped a nuclear bomb on a guinea pig without a shred of hyperbole being used. In regards to the fallout from Tess Baker, it was so severe that Glenn Seaborg, who served as the chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission from 1961 to 1971, called the aftermath of the test, and I quote, the world's first nuclear disaster. Sadly, not the world's last. Nonetheless, it was determined a nuclear testing site within the continental United States was necessary in order to maintain American nuclear superiority. During the 1950s, inter-service rivalry saw the US Army, US Navy, and newly designated US Air Force jockeying for control of the American nuclear arsenal. The Air Force wanted to control the atomic bombs delivered by manned bombers, and eventually by intercontinental missiles. The Navy, however, foresaw nuclear-tipped torpedoes, depth chargers, and submarine-launched ballistic missiles. Missiles, whereas the army experimented with artillery and even personal weapons capable of deploying atomic armaments. So all of these applications meant several different designs for weapons were needed, well beyond the implosion-type Fat Man bomb used at Nagasaki and in Operation Crossroads. New designs and improvements to existing designs meant testing to confirm their usefulness, and America continued to develop the thermonuclear hydrogen bomb, exponentially more powerful than those dropped on Japan. A test site was needed, and it should be in an area where fallout could be restricted to unpopulated regions nobody really cared about. Enter Nevada. Oh, so welcome to today's sponsor spot, but I can't do a sponsor without my co-host. Where's Snoop? <laughs> you got some right spiral on that. Let's talk about Squarespace. Tell me more about Squarespace, guys, as I make my aunt here do a little dance. Well, if you've ever wanted to create a beautiful website for yourself that you can use to promote things, advertise a business, maybe even sell products or your time, you can use Squarespace for that because they are a platform where you can make a website. And here's the thing, making a website used to be a real pain. I remember the MySpace days, just trying to get a song to play at the right volume when you like, you know, logged onto my homepage. And every time it'd just be an ear splitting volume, sorry, you're not a winner. I'm like, I'm, you know what, I am sorry. Or when you try and use like templates that you can download, they just look horrible and you can't really, edit them you couldn't really edit them but with squarespace you can because they have a fluid engine where you use a drag and drop technology where you can literally customize it anyhow you want like editing is as simple as picking something up and moving it to a different location like i will demonstrate via judicious use of this stuffed anteater hmm i would like something to be here done now let's like show what would happen if this was like you know a word document or you know trying to make a website back in the day hmm i would like to move this anteater to here and that's what had happened, like, do you remember that? Well, I won't have anyone besmirching the templates on Squarespace because they do have a massive array of them. You can use them for practically any purpose because there's a lot of different variations. But then the good thing about these is that once you've brought one in, you can then use the Fluid Engine to just completely customize it. And with all that in mind as well, why does every website look the same? Because you mentioned at the start here that you can use it to sell everything from your time to your expertise. 
And like, you might not be thinking like, you have anything of value to contribute. You absolutely do. It's just you need to figure out that thing. One of the first steps of figuring out that thing is creating a website that speaks about you as a person. And Squarespace will help with that. And if you do want to, in fact, sell anything that you have learned over the years or something you want to educate people on, there's an opportunity to use uh, Squarespace to set up a course. Mm -hmm. So you could record lessons and upload those, and then you can charge a one-time fee or a subscription service for people to access this course. And the only limits about what that could include is your own imagination. So thank you to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Check out squarespace.com forward slash geographics for 10% off on your first purchase of a website slash domain using the code geographics. And a fun thing we've been doing in these sponsor spots is ending with a bonus fact. So guys, would you like an extra bonus fact that will be present nowhere else in this video? Yay! Okay, so did you know that Liam Neeson once ate a wolf for his lunch? During the production of the film The Grey, the film with the most like misleading advertising campaign in history because it advertises itself as Taken, but it's a wolf, in which Liam Neeson does not fight any wolves and spends most of his time crying. When you said Taken, but with a wolf, I'm just imagining like... <laughs> How scary would that be? Can you imagine if you got a phone call and it's from like, you know, a member of your family that have been taken? What by? A wolf? <laughs> And all you hear down the end of the phone is like, what do you mean, awoo? And then the line goes dead. And while Liam Neeson does not punch a bunch of wolves, as the trailer suggests, uh, the producers did insist upon using actual wolf carcasses for certain scenes in the film in which there are some dead wolves. And they sourced these carcasses from a local trapper who, to help the uh, cast get into the right frame of mind, made them some stew from the wolf. And according to Liam Neeson, um, everybody was kind of hesitant to eat the wolf stew, but him being Irish was well used to eating stew and went back for seconds. <laughs> On July 27th, 1951, an atomic bomb that generated a yield of one kiloton was dropped on a dry lake bed in Nevada known as the Frenchman Flats. The explosion was an airburst and winds from the west carried the fallout from the explosion, mostly radioactive dust, from the lake bed to the east across the town of St. George, Utah. The test was the first of what became over a thousand detonated at the Nevada Proving Grounds. Testing evolved to the point that bombs with a planned yield of less than one megaton were conducted in Nevada. For the most part, those of a larger yield were detonated in the Pacific, proving grounds in the Marshall Islands. The testing was targeted at more than just determining who could build the most powerful bomb. Evaluation of survivability was also an important aspect of the site's mission. For example, civil defense shelters and bomb shelters of varying shapes and sizes were built on the site, placed at measured distances from the site of the explosion to test their effectiveness. Similarly, military formations of tanks, personnel carriers, trucks and other vehicles were pre-positioned prior to the detonation to determine the survivability of both the vehicles themselves and the occupants within. Aircraft were parked on runways, in hangars and in maintenance facilities and then subjected to, you guessed it, a nuclear bomb. Many of the films produced in the 1950s and 1960s of the duck and cover variety uh, were filmed at the site and distributed to civil defense organizations and schools. And their stated purpose was to reassure the public that nuclear war could be survivable. As a fun fact, most of the mushroom clouds that appeared in feature films during this period, including Failsafe and Dr. Strangelove, were filmed during testing conducted at this site. Anti-radiation clothing was also placed on mannequins and was similarly evaluated. Not much of it worked, for anyone curious. Underground bursts developed huge caverns under the Nevada landscape filled with radioactive stones and clay. And the radiation levels in these underground aquifers reached levels which exceeded the national standard for drinking water by some 150 times. And some of the radioactive isotopes affecting the aquifer could remain above dangerous levels for tens of thousands of years. Yeah, and if anyone's played Fallout, yeah, that's 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 not great. So these tests included cameras placed to film in slow motion how buildings collapsed before the nuclear blast, including the initial shockwave, which for anyone who's not seen the clips or just wants me to describe what happens, the first thing that happens is that paint evaporates from the heat and then a second shockwave caused the building to completely disintegrate. The films from the test site became a major feature of the anti-communist hysteria which gripped the United States from the 1950s and a major motivator for those protesting nuclear weapons testing in the early 1960s and beyond. In June 1957, the United States initiated Operation Plowshare, a series of 27 individual tests in which 35 warheads were detonated. The stated purpose of the operation, which was conducted concurrently with a similar program in the Soviet Union, was the study of nuclear weapons as a tool 
for peace. The proposed uses of nuclear warheads included expanding the Panama Canal, building a new canal through Nicaragua or Colombia, opening mountain gaps for the construction of highways and railroads, and deep mining for minerals. Some proposed uses for nuclear bombs, on the other hand, were the creation of harbours and bays, as well as man-made lakes. In 1963, a report authored by the American Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory suggests that nuclear weapons could be used to build a canal across Israel's Negev Desert, supplanting the Suez Canal and Arab influence over its use. In the 21st century, the use of explosives and water to extract shale oil and natural gas became known as fracking. In the early 1960s, a similar approach, using nuclear explosions to control the flow of natural gas, was suggested during Operation Plowshare. And if anyone curious about what happened with that, testing revealed that the gas recovered was far too contaminated for consumer use. Still, testing did continue, led by the El Paso Natural Gas Company, among others, until it became apparent the costs of recovering the gas could not be met by the amount recovered. The various detonations conducted as part of Plowshare led to the underground explosions known as Storax Sedan. Sedan was detonated from a depth of 636 feet below the Nevada test site on July 6, 1962. Its intent was to demonstrate the feasibility of using nuclear devices to support peaceful civilian applications, and it holds the distinction of covering more US residents with radioactive fallout than any other nuclear detonation. The fallout reached as far east as Illinois and as far north as South Dakota. The crater created by the blast remains the largest man-made crater in history, so yeah, it's a record breaker for numerous reasons. Go America. The Sedan Blast was the last in the United States dedicated to the peaceful use of nuclear weapons, though weapons testing did continue for many years. And just put in perspective here, Sedan contributed 7% of the total radioactive fallout to cover the United States during the period of nuclear testing. And that might not sound like a lot, but consider it was just one test out of thousands, that's a quite significant number indeed. From 1951 to 1962, when air bursts of nuclear weapons were suspended at the Nevada test site, the majority of the blasts were announced to the general public in advance of the event. As noted in the intro, Las Vegas hotels advertised the events and offered special rates on rooms facing the direction of the explosion. And if anyone wondering, was anybody made aware of the dangers of one looking directly into a nuclear blast and two? being downwind of a nuclear blast. Uh, a booklet from the Atomic Energy Commission, or AEC, advised citizens that your best action is just to not worry about fallout. Lovers sojourn to vantage points around the desert in order to watch the show, especially those detonations which occurred at night. How romantic. The Desert News even ran an editorial under the title, and I quote, spectacular atomic explosions mean progress in defense, no cause for panic. In 1953, 11 blasts occurred at the test site, and the villagers and farms downwind of the blast found their communities and homes covered in dust. Radioactive dust. The town of St. George, with a population of about 4,800 and was mostly Mormon, did not question the AAC when thousands of sheep began dying in the area. You know, mysterious circumstances. And the AEC ultimately concluded that all of the sheep died due to, and I quote, unseasonably cold weather. You know, even though sheep kind of have an inbuilt thing to protect them from the cold weather. But why would the government lie? In 1954, St. George found itself as a host to a Hollywood production, a project headed by the famed aviator and weirdo Howard Hughes and starring Susan Hayward and John Wayne. The project, the film The Conqueror, in which Wayne was cast, some would say miscast, like to put it diplomatically, as Genghis Khan. And for anyone curious about how they accomplished making John Wayne look like Genghis Khan, they covered his face in grease paint to make him look exotic, and then he proceeded to not change his accent in any way whatsoever. Now, of the 220 people who comprised the film's crew, including all the actors and stuff, 46, 21% died of cancer, and a further 91, or 41%, contracted some form of cancer, though they didn't die of it. Among those who developed cancers and survived were John Wayne's own sons, Michael and Patrick, who accompanied their father to the film site. Yay! Take your child to work day, but... Is, that's literally a Simpsons episode, right? That when Homer takes Lisa to a nuclear power plant. It is, right? That That's like a thing. And it just, it just happened. Like John Wayne did it with his kids and they both got like turbo mega cancer. Speaking of John Wayne, he died of stomach cancer in 1979 after surviving a battle with lung cancer more than a decade earlier. Director and awesome name owner Dick Powell developed lymphoma in 1962 and died from it the following year. Susan Haywood died from brain cancer in 1975. Her son, who 
also visited her on the set in Utah and developed an oral tumour, though it later proved to be benign. Agnes Moorhead, who gained fame as Endora on the television show Bewitched, died of uterine cancer in 1974. Pedro Armendariz committed suicide in 1963, having been diagnosed with inoperable kidney and neck cancer. All had worked together on the film. There were others on the film crew and cast who developed similar cancers after working downwind at the Nevada test site. Though whether nuclear weapons testing had had a role in their illness remains a subject of heated debate. Many were lifelong smokers, including John Wayne himself, who squarely blamed his own cancer on smoking rather than on the government. Howard Hughes, on the other hand, did blame the unusual number of cancers on the fallout and attempted to purchase all copies of the film in order to remove it from circulation. He failed, and it was also one of the last films he personally produced, and one of the films along with Ice Station Zebra, which he screened continually as his mind gradually failed him near the end of his life. Still, government studies and some medical professionals denied there was a link between the film set and the higher cancer rates. Yet, in the fallout zone adjacent to the test site, rates of cancers and other diseases linked with radiation exposure began to rise. In the early 1960s, rates of childhood leukemia and cancers among adults increased, an anomaly considering most residents of the area were Mormons who eschewed tobacco and alcohol as part of their religious beliefs. These residents, besides direct exposure to the fallout during testing, consumed contaminated food and beverages as a result of the fallout in the region. It seems the sheep did not die from unseasonable cold after all. In the 1980s, a series of lawsuits led to the exposure of evidence that the AEC was aware of the risks of nuclear fallout and then deliberately distorted the facts in their efforts to downplay them. In 1990, Congress passed the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, awarding up to $50,000 to those downwinders, that is, those downwind of the Nevada test site, who were affected by cancer or other radiation-linked illnesses. And while the government has never officially admitted that nuclear weapons testing caused the illnesses and deaths of these thousands of people over the decades, its denials have become somewhat hollow in the face of subsequent investigations and the fact they just paid people off who'd managed to survive to get them to shut up. Because there's one thing we know that like, you know, innocent people and entities love doing, it's paying people to stop suing them. Beginning in 1955, five nations entered into negotiations to restrict nuclear weapons testing in the atmosphere. The nations were the United States, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, Canada and France. Negotiations were long and difficult with the two major powers, the United States and the Soviet Union, chiefly concerned over the size of their arsenals and maintaining their readiness with respect to one another. Cold War crises, including those in Berlin and in Cuba, affected these negotiations. They became a major bone of contention in the United States during the presidential elections of 1960. Conservatives were generally against the treaty, while liberals, including candidate John F. Kennedy, supported it. The treaty was agreed to in early 1963 and ratified by the Soviet Union in August of that year, after eight years of give and take. The US Senate ratified the treaty in September and a month later it entered into force. The treaty banned nuclear test detonations in the atmosphere, in outer space and underwater. It did rather conveniently not ban underground testing and test detonations of this kind, continued at the Nevada test site for nearly three decades afterwards. Underground explosions were restricted to ensure they did not allow radioactive debris to be present outside the territorial limits of the state whose jurisdiction or control they were conducted in. In other words, radioactive fallout was restricted to in the borders of the signatory nations, but not fully banned. Testing in Nevada continued without slackening pace for the rest of the period known as the Cold War. A major statement of the treaty included something which the United States had long denied, that of damaging the environment through the detonation of nuclear weapons. The stated intent of the treaty included the goal of achieving, and I quote, an end to the contamination of man's environment by radioactive substances. The United States has not conducted atmospheric nuclear testing since becoming a signatory to the treaty in 1963, yet underground testing in Nevada did continue for years. When President Truman established the Nevada Test Site, then known as the Nevada Proving Grounds, it consisted of a 680 square mile site located within the Nellis Air Force Bombing and Gunnery Range. It has since grown to twice that original size, clocking in at some 1360 square miles, containing over 400 miles of paved roads and highways, and over 300 miles of unpaved roads, and more than 1100 buildings of all types and sizes. It is operated by a joint venture known as Mission Support and Test Services. The joint venture participants' companies are Jacobs Engineering Group, 
Honeywell International and Huntington's in Gall's Industries. The joint venture operates and maintains the site for National Nuclear Security Administration created by Congress in 1999, which is based in Washington, D.C. The site was targeted by protesters beginning in the 1970s and continuing well into the 90s. In the period between 1986 and 1994, over 500 anti-nuclear weapons protests were held at or near the site. Most of these protests were over the continuing testing of nuclear weapons underground and the damaging effects they presented to people's health. During the 1990s, studies found that soldiers who had witnessed nuclear tests experienced higher rates of several types of cancers, as well as much higher rates of leukemia than should be statistically expected. Efforts to inform the public of the special circumstances facing these veterans has resulted in the creation of the National Association of Atomic Veterans and other similar support groups. On September 23, 1992, the last underground detonation of a nuclear device that we know of at the Nevada test site occurred. Since then, the site has been used for a variety of tests that do not generate a nuclear yield that we know of. It houses research facilities and the National Environmental Research Park. Several of the activities of the site offer scheduled tours to those interested in seeing their tax dollars hard at work. In addition, nearby Las Vegas is home to the Atomic Museum, an affiliate of the Smithsonian. The museum presents exhibits describing nuclear espionage, toys and games featuring atomic weapons and energy, and some of the more unusual and eclectic weapons proposed for the deployment of nuclear warheads to the battlefield throughout history. Underground, the test site is a labyrinth of huge chasms, shafts and tunnels, contaminated aquifers and radioactive heaps of rubble. It remains in a state of preparedness to resume nuclear weapons testing, should it ever be deemed there exists a need for it to do so. In 2010, the site's name was changed to the Nevada National Security Site, under which it operates today, housing activities from Homeland Security, FEMA, and other federal agencies and activities. The United States is a signatory to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in September 1996. The treaty is not in force since it has not been ratified by the United States Senate, as required by law. India and Pakistan, both nuclear powers in their own rights, have similarly not signed the treaty. Neither has North Korea believed by many to have developed nuclear weapons of some kind. So, while it is hoped that the US will never have to resume nuclear weapons testing with all of its ills and pitfalls, it is possible that sometime in the future, tests to ensure the efficacy of its nuclear arsenal may resume. Great! This was a fun read, wasn't it, folks? I certainly enjoyed learning about how just the American government nuked a bunch of guinea pigs. That was awesome! I feel so great! And if you feel great, why not leave a like, a comment with some feedback or suggestions for future things that are also super fun to talk about. I'm being sarcastic. But yeah, leave a like, comment with anything, feedback, suggestions, all that good stuff. Follow our author, Larry Holdsworth, at the social below. Myself, Carl Smallwood, if you're so inclined. Follow our sister channels, Biographics and Top Tens. All that good stuff, you know the drill. And just, as always, like, as I like to say, go out there and have the day you all deserve. <laughs>